Hey, good evening, everybody. How are you? Good. Um, I am Margaret Williams. I'm the Chief Financial Officer here at the Gulf of Maine Research Institute. I don't get to do this very often, so I'm really excited to be here, and I'm delighted to have you all here. How many of you have never been to a presentation here before? Just one. Welcome. Two? Okay. <laughs> one and a maybe. Um, so I think you all know the, the sort of the house rules, no food or drink here, and the bathrooms are down the hallway. Um, this is the first lecture in a series of debunking ocean myths. The, so it's, this is kind of an exciting kickoff of that particular sequence. And I have the great honor of introducing uh, Dr. Steve Ayers, who is one of our valued research scientists here at the Gulf of Maine Research Institute. And Steve uh, began his uh, career as a fisherman in Australia, in the Middle East, and Southeast Asia. And then he moved into research. Uh, he worked at the Australian Maritime College. And he played a key role there in the development of selecting fishing gears and um, a variety, in a variety of fisheries in Australia and other countries. And back in 2006, GMRI decided we really needed a scientist in this area, and we literally did a global search to find someone of Steve's caliber, and we found him in Tasmania. It took us a long time, <laughs> but we did find him, and he, he agreed to come, come work with us here. We we're so excited because he really works here on developing environmentally friendly fishing gear and working collaboratively with our fishermen and other stakeholders. So I will turn the podium over to Steve for his presentation. Margaret, for that glowing introduction, and it's been 11 years of, of great experiences. I've really enjoyed my, my journey here. Uh, welcome to GMRI. Thank you for giving up your Thursday evening. I know it's a wonderful evening out there tonight, but I really do appreciate you coming tonight. And I'm going to talk to you, if I can get to the first slide, there we go. Uh, I'm going to talk to you about one of the ocean myths, and that is about bottom trawling. And bottom trawling suffers from a really bad reputation, and uh, the reputate or the myth here is that bulldoze. Uh, Bottom trawls are bulldozers of the ocean. And so I'm, that's the myth that I'm going to tackle tonight. And if you are interested in learning anything about bottom trawls, generally the first place the public goes to is the internet, which is a fairly obvious place to go. And when you, if you were to type in bottom trawls or bottom trawl impact, you would very quickly come across rhetoric such as this, uh, where they say trawls, particularly bottom trawls, bulldozers of the ocean, scooping up and destroying everything in their path. And there's, there's many other quotes online. Atlantic cod, it's mostly caught by bottom trawling, which is like clear cutting the seafloor. And this one, in an action akin to bulldozing forests to catch songbirds and squirrels, nets mounted on massive rollers are dragged across the seabed, strip mining everything in their path. So you would look at that and go, gee, this is all doom and gloom. We're going to hell in a handbasket. We've got to stop bottom trawls. If you look a little bit further and look at images on the internet, you will come across very readily images such as this. Bottom trawling can never be sustainable and that big earth moving equipment, and clearly it's about to encounter the reef. And here we have some fish and behind the, the, this equipment, it's all dead and barren and there's no fish there. And so it's a pretty stark image. And there are lots of others, the so-called before and after slides which show a bit of reef before supposedly a trawling encountered it and then after a trawl, encountered it. And images such as this, and this one here comes from Louisiana, and this shows a trawler obviously working in very shallow, shallow water, because that is, as it's towing its nets through the water, it's disturbing the seabed sediments, the sediments are rising to the surface, and that's what you see. And we know it's really shallow water because here's the prop wash. So it's not very deep where those guys are operating. But if you have a look, yes, it is bringing up seabed sediments to the surface, but there are also areas where it's occurring naturally. And then I think this is also in the Louisiana area as well, and these squiggly lines all represent where boats have been. 
So yes, there's a, a reasonable amount of impact that occurs when you trawl uh, over the seabed. This is probably one of the most famous or infamous images, if you like. And so this is a satellite image of a river in China. It might be the, the Yangtze or the Yellow River, I can't quite remember, which purportedly shows all these trawlers. And at the time this image came out, some of the, the most renowned environmentalists in the world said, see, we told you this is exactly what trawlers do. And you can see what's going on here. You can see the sediment being lifted up to the surface. But all this here is natural. Okay, so that's not trawling activity. Well, it was only a few weeks later when someone had a close look and realised, well, hey, they're not, actually not trawlers. These are boats that are anchored and they have the nets down on the bottom. And yes, they're still causing su substantial disturbance, but they certainly aren't, are not trawlers. And then there's lots of other images about the bycatch, which is the, the, the part of the catch that fishermen don't want. And usually it's discarded overboard. And when it's discarded overboard, many of the species are already dead or they are dying. And so it's easy to come across images such as this and this one here. This is from a tropical shrimp fishery. There's a couple of shrimp there, <coughs> uh, stingray and some other animals as well. And so if you just focused on that information, you would be thinking that it's all about doom and gloom, that trawlers are just bulldozers of the ocean and tearing everything up, catching all the squirrels and songbirds, and there's going to be nothing left. So lots of emotional rhetoric that supports the images. And the impact in one location, one of the things you don't readily get from this information is that, yes, there might be a substantial impact in one area, but you can't necessarily translate it to all areas where trawling occurs. And I'll get into that a little bit later on. The, the imagery in the rhetoric generally also refers to trying to recover habitats. And recover, recover habitats to what? Part of the problem is we have a very poor understanding, in most instances, of what the seabed was like before trawling occurred. The other thing is we could ask why do we need to recover it at all? I'm sure when you drove here tonight on the road, you didn't say to yourself, geez, I'll be glad when that road goes and we can recover that bit of habitat. We don't think like that. So why should we be thinking about it with trawling? Particularly when trawling is a food production system, which is, a, which is something that people generally forget very readily. Fishermen are, after all, out there catching food, harvesting food. Also, one of the, one of the um, the premises you might get from this, this information is that there's been no work, that there is no improvement in fishing gear, that it's all about tearing up the bottom, catching all the squirrels and songbirds, and that there is no work done by people like myself or fishermen to reduce those impacts. And we'll get to that very shortly. Trawling generally is a poster child for everything that's bad with, the, with fishing. It's often held up as the, the worst offender of the lot. And one of the things that often gets confused here is that uh, you know, when, when people talk about overfishing, it's not always about trawling. There are a whole range of other fishing gears out there that are historically have also been responsible for overfishing. And by way of example, this, this chart here, this starts in 1860 and goes to about 1930. And this is the landings of cod in the Gulf of Maine over that period of time. Now, I'm sure some of you know a little bit about the history of cod in the region and know that it's the oldest colonial industry in the country, has a history of about 400 years, a little bit over 400 years now. Well, in about 1862, they kept records of what were landed, and it was about 67,500 metric tonnes. Okay? And then soon thereafter, we see we have a decline, and about 40 years later, it was only about 22,500 metric tonnes. Anyone tell me how they caught the fish in those days? Anyone got an idea? Dories, hook and line. That there represents probably the peak cod landings in the history of Gulf of Maine fishing. Caught by hook and line using what sort of boats? Dories. Dories, sail powered. What we consider these days to be rather old technology. And yet we managed soon thereafter to very quickly drop off landings over fishing. Not by trawling, but by this old technology that was really badly managed at the time. And you can see about this period of time here is when, when trawlers were first introduced to the region and we got a little bit of a spike in cod and then it just sort of levelled off slowly declined. Note, that's around 20,000 metric tonnes in about the early 1920s. Let's jump now to the 1960s, 1960s here to modern time. The green line here is cod. In 1963, Gulf main landings of cod were around 1,000 metric tonnes. So from 22,500 40 years ago down to about 1,000. 
And then over time, fishermen managed to adapt and, and apply some new technology, and they got better at the game, and, and you can see landings increased. They reached a peak of around 10,000 metric tonnes in about 1990. But even that's a shadow of the former landings. And then the landings dropped really quickly, and they've been down here, and sadly, they've been down here ever since. So this here is an example of where it's not necessarily the gear that's at fault. Previously, there was too many fishermen using too many hooks and, and lines and dories. Nothing to do with trawling. And there was an absence of management, by and large. It wasn't until around, around here that we started to introduce management as we know it now. And as you can see, it still didn't stem the tide, and it hasn't done a very good job at recovering the stocks. So management has been largely responsible for our inability to return stocks to their former glory, not the gear itself. I really jumped the gun a little bit and said fishing is, is often considered an irrele irrelevant food production system. But one thing you should know is it's the single most traded commodity on the planet. It's worth about $130 billion a year, and it's about 120% more valuable than the next uh, uh, most traded commodity, soybean. Fish from trawling and other fishing gears is really important to the globe. It's important for sources of animal protein. Many countries, individuals, they rely almost entirely on fish for their animal protein. It's important for food security and for global commerce. Fishing is a really big deal. All right, so after that diatribe, let's start with who I am, a closer look at trawling. We'll talk a little bit about the impacts of bottom trawling. And I'll focus a little bit on shrimp as well because there's been a history of shrimping in this part of the world. I'm going to talk about seabed impact in particular and bycatch and discards. And remember, bycatch is that, that, that part of the catch that fishermen don't want to target, they don't want to keep, and generally gets discarded overboard. I'm going to make a comparison between fishing and farming. I'll talk about some of the work we've been doing to reduce impacts, and I'm going to finish up with some concluding statements. So Margaret did a great, great job introducing me and uh, so here's me uh, building some gear, which I occasionally get to do, working on fishing boats, have a really good gig, working with fishermen and trying to measure the impact of fishing activity and trying to reduce environmental impact. And I've been doing that since 2007. Prior to that, working at the Australian Maritime College, I had an academic function, but I also got involved in a lot of research and, and interest in bycatch reduction really, really uh, kicked off um, during my time at the Australian Maritime College, and so I was able to play a, a fairly major role in some of the work around Australia. And so this is me on the back deck of a boat looking at some shrimp gear with a bunch of Australian fishermen. This is me in Nigeria doing the same with some fishermen and researchers, and we're, we're using, we're, I'm, sh I'm showing how to avoid turtles in shrimp trawl gear. Here I am in Kuwait with a couple of researchers, and here is me trying to look incredibly intelligent at an intergovernmental organisation meeting in Thailand talking about shrimp bycatch reduction. Prior to that, I fished commercially. And here I am in my young days trying to be a suntan bronzed Australian and really just accumulating skin cancers later in life, unfortunately. But uh, <laughs> hey, that's what happens. But here's a, here's a catch of fish and shrimp uh, taken in the Persian Gulf. I managed to spend nine months there working for an Australian company in a joint venture arrangement. And this, is, this was a, a, one of our very first catches of, uh, of shrimp, but as you'll see later, catches do get better. Here is me looking particularly unintelligent, with, uh, with it's not an alien radio detector um, on my head. It's actually a sponge which has been ripped out of the seabed by, by a shrimp trawl, and I decided to play silly buggers. Um, and here I am being even more silly with a sea snake, and just gives you an idea of some of the things that we catch. The the bycatch issue in global fisheries it's generally generally considered that tropical shrimp trawl fisheries are the worst offenders. And in terms of pound of shrimp per pound of bycatch or per pound of discards, they are generally the worst offenders. And this catch here, it's actually quite a reasonable one. You can see these shrimp here, and you can see all these fish that are caught. These fish are all dead or dying. They're all adults, they've all spawned probably several times, but they are certainly being discarded overboard because there's no market for them. Other problems we have in the tropics, uh, large animals such as uh, sea turtles and animals like this. This is a shovel nose ray. This measures about four metres long. And so when I was fishing, these things were regularly caught and there was not much we could do about them. And if they were really lively, that was an interesting exercise trying to get that off the boat without being hit by the tail. One of the other fisheries I got involved in was this orange roughy fishery, 
this is me in my more hirsute days, uh, believe it or not. And, uh, and here we are with a bag of orange ruffy. Uh, orange ruffy you catch in about 1,000 metres of water, it's about 3,000 feet. This, this fishing gear was on the bottom for about 10 minutes, moving down the side of a seamount, and that's about 70 metric ton of orange ruffy. And they were all kept, and there's about a ton, maybe a ton and a half of black dory, which was discarded, we had no market for it. But these sorts of clean toes, where you get mostly the target catch, were pretty much the norm for orange ruffy, because you were targeting them, them in schooling aggregations. So that was really good. Not a lot of bycatch or discarding going on here. All clean orange ruffy. Two problems with orange ruffy. Looks really nice in this environment. That fish there may live to over 100 years of age. And it doesn't become sexually mature until about 30 years of age, maybe a little bit later. So when the fishery opened up, and we've all, we're all thinking about the gold rush that's going to go, go on, we just went and hit it. And we really knocked that stock pretty hard. And in fact, it was overfished, and, that, and eventually fishing had to pretty much cease. You can't go and uh, heavily fish a stock that, doesn't, that lives to 100 years and doesn't spawn until 30 without paying a price. The other issue is you can see the habitat that this animal lives in, all these soft corals and what have you. And when you run trawl gear over the bottom, and I'll show you some trawl gear in a minute, uh, you do significant damage to that particular type of environment. This here is a piece of red coral on the back of a stern trawler in New Zealand. Uh, fishing for orange ruffy. That coral there is probably, possibly, about 500 years old. So you cannot do that for very long, of course, before you have you know, significant long-term impacts. And that, that habitat probably hasn't and may not ever fully recover. Um, so I have the dubious distinction, if you like, of being involved in two of the worst fisheries, if you like, uh, going anywhere. The tropical shrimp fishery, where I spend a lot of time catching a lot of bycatch and discarding it overboard and working in the orange ruffy fishery for a period, period of time. While the catch was nice and clean, obviously we're having substantial impacts on the seabed. So that's given me an interesting perspective about what I do now and about fisheries in general. This is what a trawl looks like, very simply. Fundamentally, it's a bag of net that tapers down to the end. This here, this is called the cod end. This is the end of the road for the cod and everything else and it's a tapered bag and all the fish get funneled down to the cot end. It gets run over the seabed at around 2.5 knots, which is about two miles per hour. And across the top of the net, there are, this is called the head rope. This is where it has a series of floats at the top to keep that part of the net open. Along the bottom, it's called a sweep. It's, that's heavier gear that keeps the trawl down. So you've now got vertical opening with the floats wanting to lift the gear up and the, the, the ground gear on the bottom. And spread by these two otter boards, or more commonly here called doors, because historically these things were built out of timber and they were rectangular in shape, and so they just look like a standard door. Well, the door acts on the bottom like this. Here's a curved, a slightly curved door on the bottom. This is a couple of other, other types. They can get very large depending on the size of the boat. And some of the trawlers over in, over in Alaska and, and Washington State, these doors here probably weigh several thousand pounds. Their function is to put the gear on the bottom. They operate like underwater aeroplane wings, except they're generating lift horizontally. So they spread the gear open, and as the gear is moved out over the seabed, those doors are pushing the, the gear open, and, they're trying, and you're trying to catch all the fish in the middle. And you can see here that one of the things doors do is they disturb the seabed sediments. And you actually need that to actually help with the fishing operation because what you want is that, that sand cloud to run down the wires which go down to the boat, to, to the net, sorry, which I'll show shortly, and that acts like a bit of a barrier. And interestingly enough, fish don't want to swim through that cloud and, and try to escape. They actually stay within the confines of the gear, which is pretty neat if you're a fisherman. The other thing to point out here is the seabed. Most trawling around the world occurs on flat, sand, soft mud, cobbly type seabed, okay? Those images of reefs and what have you that you saw before, you can't use bottom trawl on those reefs. You don't last long and you might do 50 grand's worth of gear, if not more, just like that. Fishmen don't work those areas. Most trawling occurs in this sort of substrate. All right, the sweep gear that I spoke of is made out of, it's a steel wire rope, <coughs> excuse me, and you have these rubber discs that are threaded through, <coughs> excuse me. In this part of the world, we tend to use discs that are around 12 inches in diameter. They're basically punched out tractor or truck tyres. And 
when that rubber it seems really heavy, and there's a silly bugger trying to lift it. Oh, that's me. Um, trying to lift it here. When you put that in the water, that loses about 60% of its weight as soon as you put it in the water. So it's heavy, but it's not as heavy when you put it down. And you can see its function is to run over the seabed, keeps this netting, this is the bottom panel net off the bottom, so that you minimise the damage. And it generally generates a, a, a strong contrasting image. And you can see this, these fish here are actually responding to the visual image of this approaching gear. You can see they're trying to burst away in that direction, and these ones are actually going in that direction. So its function is really just to get the gear on the bottom and help you pass over the bottom and, uh, and help herd fish. So we've spoken about the doors, we've spoken about the sweep. The ground cable here, particularly this, this length here, it may be 40 fathoms or more in length, depending on the sort of bottom fishermen are operating in. And it's basically a steel wire rope with three inch rubber pieces all threaded through. And again, its job is to help herd fish. And then, of course, the net, the, the trawl is made out of netting material. In this part of the world, in the Gulf of Maine, the mesh size, and by that we mean from this knot to that opposing knot there, in this part of the trawl is six inches, and in the cot end it's six and a half. It has to be at least six and a half. And that's the largest cot end mesh size of any ground fish fishery probably on the planet. So it's actually very, very, uh, very large and very good. Um, moving on, giving you a sense of just how ubiquitous trawling is around the globe. I, m I mentioned earlier how important it is. Uh, this, this chart here shows all these red areas pretty much show where most bottom trawling for fish occurs. Okay, and as you can see, it's going on all over the place. What it's not showing is where the shrimp trawl fisheries are, particularly in the tropics. And there are shrimp trawl fisheries across northern Australia and through Indonesia and around this part of the world, over at southern, over at Nigeria and over here. Um, and Gulf of Mexico, there are shrimp trawl fisheries down here in the Caribbean. So it's not showing you all the trawl fisheries, but it's just showing where all bottom trawling occurs. And as you can see, it really is all over the place. The trawling is a global activity. It's responsible for about 25% of global fish landings. All right. So move on a little bit. Just think a little bit about trawling in our part of the world here. First of all, just to digress a little bit, US land mass is about 3.8 million square miles. And just to point out that this is a little bit dated, but it, it serves our purpose well, that pretty much all the land, all the, all the US land mass is now being designated as some sort of human use area. You can see about 18% of it is cropland, 27% is grassland and pasture, there's forest use land, special use land, urban areas and miscellaneous. So there's pretty much not too much territory out there that hasn't been earmarked for one purpose or another. All right, here we have the continental shelf, okay, and extends around much of the US, and all countries have one of these, and all countries that have coastline have one of these. And the continental shelf generally extends, it's thought to extend from zero to 200 metres or 600 feet, if you like. And that's where the vast majority of global fishing activity occurs, although there is some high seas activity. But the continental shelf is where much of it goes on. And certainly bottom trawling, I don't know of anybody now that's trawling off the continental shelf. So any trawling activity is going to occur in these areas. Well, this chart here, I hope you recognise this coastline. Don't you in trouble. <laughs> uh, and this line here is the Hague line. This is Canadian waters. This is US waters. And these five areas here are closed areas. So these are areas closed off to commercial fishing activity. Uh, not all fishing activity, but certainly closed off to trawling activity for most of the year. These dots here represent fishing effort, the amount of time fishermen spent in 2003 fishing these particular areas. So these blue dots here, purpley dots, between one to eight hours of fishing activity, nine to 25 and so on. And you can see what's going on is that most activity is occurring around the boundaries of those closed areas. And that's because what those fishermen are trying to do is, is access fish that are spilt over out of the closed areas. So remember, these are areas that are closed off to fishing. What we hope is the abundance of fish increases, and then eventually some of them move out of that protected area, and there the fishermen are waiting to harvest them. A couple of things to, else to point about out here. Yeah, it's 2003, so I've used a pretty old chart. Maybe I should use something a bit new. One reason I haven't is that fishing activity for haddock and other ground fish was there was 
probably at least two, maybe three times the number of fishing boats fishing for those ground fish species at that time. There was a lot more fishing activity at that time. So this actually represents, in a sense, a worst case scenario compared to what we would expect today. Also note that a lot of these areas are not fished. So even though in this continental shelf area, potentially there's a lot of area that could be trawled, there's not a lot of trawling going on all over the place. And then if we have a look at a fisherman's plotter, we can drill in a little bit further and just see how concentrated and discreet the fishing activity really is in these areas. And so this is a plotter from a commercial fisherman, works out a Newbury port, and this is the seabed here, and these coloured lines represent historical trawl tracks. And as you can see, he's been towing up and down the same spot lots of times. Now, I don't know how, how many is in there or how long that is, but that's probably weeks, if not months, if not longer, of fishing activity. So all this area that could still be trawled isn't trawled, primarily because it's either unsuitable for trawling or there's no fish, and he prefers to work these particular areas. And you can get an idea of just how far that is. That's about 2.8 kilometres. I thought I'd, I thought I'd turn that into an imperial figure. I think that's about 9,200 feet. There we go. Give you an idea. And each one of those trawl tracks is actually wider than his actual trawl mark. It's just an indication on the screen. And yet, despite all this repeated effort, if he was tearing up the habitat, if he was catching all the fish, destroying the habitat entirely, why is he going back again? Why is he still catching fish in the same spot, day after day, week after week, month after month, probably year after year? And the reality is that, yes, the trawl is having some impacts, but there's a degree of sustainability going on here, where just because the trawl's gone through once doesn't mean all the fish disappear, doesn't mean you've totally destroyed the habitat. It means you can come back again and again and still harvest fish from the same location. So let's think a little bit about the effect of trawling on the diversity of benthic invertebrates, which is really a name for saying those animals that live on the seabed that don't have a backbone. So sponges, and corals, little sea, sea worms and other things that live on the bottom. What happens to them when you introduce trawling into a new area? And so here's a, this chart here shows time on this axis here, and this is diversity. Here's a diversity of one, meaning one, one, one species one species of coral, one species of, of uh, sponge, what have you. And when fishing first commences, what happens is, well, let's take a step back. Before fishing occurs, the environment probably fluctuates fairly naturally. That The diversity of animals on the bottom probably changes a little bit over a period of time. It's probably never static. And then when fishing occurs, particularly trawling, one of the things that happens is that's when you'll have your greatest impact on a new area. You probably do most damage to benthic invertebrates at that time. They're not used to, to encountering fishing activity. They're highly vulnerable to the trawl gear. And so the diversity probably decreases fairly rapidly in the early days. There's not a lot of good science here to help us out with this, but it's probably about right that diversity drops quickest early in the piece, and then later on it begins to level out where you get natural variation of fishing impact at some level of diversity lower than what you started with. Okay? But the point is it's not at one. And the reason I point that out is because when farmers go to a new piece of territory, what are the first thing they do? They go and knock the trees down, they pull out the shrubs, they turn over the ground, they basically pull everything out, and then they plant one crop, one at a time. Corn, wheat, whatever. Diversity is now at one. And that's a, that's a threshold that fishing, and trawling in particular, can never hope to reduce the environment down to, to a threshold of one. And yet, it happens, and most of the farming area in the United States and elsewhere for that matter looks like this, does it not? And the diversity there is one. And what's more, what do farmers do when they're trying to grow a food crop in particular? Little bugs and critters that are around, they try to poison them. They don't want the, the things that eat the, eat the crop. So a lot of the animals try, are, are, are removed through poisons and what have you. And yet for some reason we seem to ac accept that as that's the price, that's the cost of producing food. Well. Why, why is the difference? Why, why is trawling held to a very different standard to a land-based activity, which ultimately is producing food as well? So, I mentioned before that there's, there's limited science that's, that's gone on historically. Well, it's not entirely true. Uh, recently, hot off the press, very hot off the press, was this study that 
came out where these global uh, fishery scientists did a, a review of 70 global studies looking at the impacts of trawling and other towed fishing gear on the seabed. And these studies are called BACI studies, before, after, um, oh, geez, now my mind's gone, gone blank. Um, <laughs> um, anyway, it doesn't matter, we'll get there, I'll get there. Uh, basically what they do is, is they, they go and evaluate what's living in an area, they then apply fishing effort, and then they come back later and they evaluate what's left, and they look at the recovery of what's left as well. Okay, and so 70 of these studies were reviewed globally, and this is the, high, this is the results. And they established that on average, only about 6% of benthic invertebrates, which if you recall are the things like the sponges and the corals and sea whips and sea worms and other things, are removed per toe, on average. So there's some, some percentage more, there's some percentage less. And basically what that means is, based on the studies done so far, there is no fact to that statement that trawlers bulldoze everything and tear everything off the bottom in one toe. At this stage, it's about 6% per toe. Okay, so that's a, that's a significant improvement. It's not perfect, of course, because it means you're taking out 6% with one toe and 6% with a su subsequent toe and so on, but it's not taking it all out in one go. Seabed penetration by the fishing gear, the doors in particular, they do penetrate the seabed given they're so heavy, less than one inch. And on the continental shelf, the recovery of this of benthic invertebrates is generally around two to six years, which is not bad. Okay, now remember there are some areas like the areas where we fish for orange ruffy, where those corals, they're going to take 500 years to grow back to where they were before. Okay, but on the continental shelf, where things are a lot, where it's shallower, where the environment is a lot more dynamic, the recovery is much sooner. It's not as good as we'd like, but it's, it's actually better than, than what some of that, that information would have you to believe. And the good thing about this study is it basically now puts a line in the sand. It says, this is, this is, the, this is, the, this is the facts. This is what the truth is about trawling. And some of that other stuff there, that's just emotional rhetoric. This is the truth of the matter. All right, so what is being done to reduce the impacts even further? And I've already spoken a little bit about closed areas, particularly in the Gulf of Maine. And some of those areas are closed permanently to fishing activity. There are some seasonal closed areas, and some are closed off to particular fishing gear types at certain times of the year. There are also a lot of gear regulations. The type of gear you can use, how big it is, uh, its design, those sorts of things. Particularly in United States waters now, fishermen are confronted with an awful lot of regulations pertaining to the type of gear they can use and where they can and cannot fish. Uh, there's also, um, in addition to regulations, other management strategies such as quota. And I haven't spoken about that before, but for those of you that don't know, all the ground fish that come out of the Gulf of Maine and southern New England are all managed by quota now, which means that every year fishermen gets an allocation in poundage of the amount of cod and haddock and pollock and other things that he can land per year. Okay, so they're given a quota at the beginning of the year and they can then begin to plan how they're going to utilise that quota throughout the fishing year. So the opportunity to overfish now theoretically has been eliminated because the quotas are set based on the best available science, which isn't as good as it might always be, but, but arguably the, the quota fishermen get should prevent overfishing of all ground fish species forever and a day. Gear-wise, and this is the sort of stuff that I do, uh, I'm going to talk briefly about three modifications. And one is semi-pelagic doors, and here's an image here where the door is off the bottom. And you can see it looks a little bit like an underwater aeroplane wing, which is exactly what it is. And a few years ago, the fishermen on this boat uh, came across semi-pelagic doors and decided I'm going to give them a go. And he did, and two years later, I managed to get on his boat and measure performance of those doors. And here's his full size, here's what the door looks like, and this is what his traditional one looks like. So it's a bit smaller, in fact, it's about 22% smaller in area, and about 9% lighter. And this door generally flies reasonably clear of the seabed, although occasionally it does kiss the seabed, and there's a bit of polish on the shoe of the, of the door, uh, indicating that it's been touching down. And so our estimate was that it reduced seabed impact by 95%. It wasn't totally off the bottom, but 
only about 5% and the contact was intermittent. This is why he's using it because he's also enjoying a 12% fuel saving and he's not reducing any catch. So remember the sand cloud that I spoke of that these doors generate? Well this one here off the bottom doesn't generate much of a sand cloud and clearly it's not having much of an impact on his catch. So, he's, so there's a win-win situation. The environment's getting a bit of a respite from trawl gear, or from the trawl doors, and he's also using less fuel and his catch is staying about the same. We've done a lot of work looking at cod end mesh sizes. And this underwater image here is, is taken from the United Kingdom, but it, it shows a cod end which is very similar to what you would see here in the Gulf of Maine. A lot of fishermen use diamond mesh material. Uh -huh, you can see what's called diamond mesh material. And you can see how it distorts when the catch accumulates in that cod end. If you're a fish in this area here, your opportunity to escape is next to nothing because you're pressed up against the meshes and are blocking them. If you're this fish here trying to move forward and get through those meshes, you're probably not going to get out either. One of the problems with diamond mesh is that as you load up with catch, those diamond meshes close off. You can see there's a little narrow band here this fish here looks like it's trying to get out. And so in this area, that's only that's about all the opportunity you have to get out, unless you're a really small critter that can fit through. We've been doing a lot of work with square mesh. And as you can see, it basically means you turn the mesh 45 degrees and the mesh stays nice and square. Uh, and it doesn't matter how much you load up the cot end and it's square across the entire length of the cot end as well. So small pollock and cod and things like that they have good opportunity to escape through those meshes. If you're a flat fish though, you're really going to struggle. So this guy here probably can't get out. But if you want to avoid juvenile cod and haddock, for example, square mesh is the way to go. And in fact, we've been doing work with fishermen using this as, as a six and a half inch material. And some fishermen are now voluntarily gone to seven inches, which is a massive opening as a square mesh. And they're still able to retain adult fish and they're discarding, or they're not discarding, those fish are escaping and not being caught. If you've been following the news, you'll know that cod stock is in pretty imperiled shape these days, and the cod quota uh, is at, and the landings of cod are at their historic low levels. So after 400 years of history, we now, fishermen are now limited to around 200 metric tonnes, uh, a bit over 200, maybe 280 in the Gulf of Maine per year. And so one of the things we've been doing is trying to help fishermen avoid cod. Because remember, they've got a quota of cod, and if it's a very small quota and you've got a big quota of haddock, one of the problems you might encounter is if you try to target those haddock, if, these, if you're also catching these cod and then you run out of quota, you then have two options. You either stop fishing or you've got to try and buy quota from somebody else. So there's an imperative now to avoid cod, which I think is ironic after 400 years. Uh, but anyway, that's how it is. So what we decided was to reduce the vertical opening of trawls and typically they're around six or seven feet tall and we wanted to go down to two, two and a half feet and see if we can't operate a net and go under a lot of the cod but also design it so that cod near the seabed could swim over the top. And we did that by increasing the length of the head rope relative to the sweep. And we built this net, we went out to sea and fortunately for us it worked an absolute dream and here are the six uh, most common species that we encountered. This is the traditional or standard net at about six feet vertical opening. Here is our, our low opening trawl. We called it the U-lot, ultra low opening trawl. And you can see it dramatically reduced the cod catch compared to the standard. And even better was these are our other species that we want to keep is that the catches are fairly similar between the two nets. And so this was just a fantastic outcome that we were very happy about. I also want to point out this, that the total catch with the standard net during these trials was just over 8,700 kilograms. And here is the total catch of these six species. This represents about 92% of the total catch. And most of this are all adults legal sized and are kept. There's not a lot of discarding going on here in the Gulf of Maine. A lot of what the fishermen are using and catching uh, are these fish. They're retaining most of it. And there's not a lot of stuff going overboard. So this was a nice result. Uh, the, the trawl was doing the job, and in fact, the U-lot reduced the cod catch by 45%, which we were very pleased about. No reduction in other species, and we reduced fuel by 7% as well. So that was a nice, nice little bonus as well. All right, enough about some of the stuff I've been doing. Just to begin to, to wrap up now, 
Uh, here's an interesting way to think about trawling, which, which is, really hasn't seen the light of day, and which, which, which really sort of makes you think differently about trawling activity. And that's to use this, this term, energy return on investment, which is the ratio of usable energy, the pr generally the protein energy that, that, that's in the fish that you catch, uh, divided by the amount of energy used to harvest that seafood. So it's energy in, energy out, basically. And when we use this ratio, and we look at various uh, fish harvesting methods, various fishing gears and fish farming, and some industrialised food production systems in the United States, we find, for example, that industrial beef production in the United States is horribly inefficient, that you put in about 1,000 units of energy in and you get about 1.9 unit out on average. Whereas if we move up the scale, we start to move into some of these fishing methods and we, per se, which I haven't spoken of, trawling, which you know a bit about now, this is a result from Portland with fishermen here, we get about 8.4% efficiently efficiency. Well, 8.4 is not that, that great, but it's about four and a half better, times better than industrialised beef production. And we see here that farm shrimp from Thailand is very low, a lot of energy in, a lot out. We see that finfish farming can be really high. And so this really provides an interesting perspective with which to view trawling against some of the other more traditional food production systems that we think about. And by and large, fishing is a really efficient fish, uh, food production system using this metric. All right, some conclusions now. So I didn't speak too much about temperate water uh, shrimp trawling. Some of you may know that there hasn't been a shrimp trawl fishery in the Gulf of Maine for about three or four years now. Um, historically overfished, environmental conditions are changing, it seems to be less conducive to, to the shrimp species. Historically, fishermen used to catch a lot of bycatch and discard it overboard with the shrimp. These days it looks more like this when it's ongoing because fishermen use a device in their net which helps separate a lot of the fish out and they escape underwater and the shrimp go through to the cod end and get retained. And if you want to know a little bit more about that during question time or afterwards, I can show you some images that really describe that. But this is, what, this is more usual these days when the fishery is in operation. In by, the bycatch issue with shrimp fisheries still now resides with largely resides in the tropics. And this is still the state of play. Lots of fish, dead and dying, a couple of shrimp in here, uh, one turtle, which we need to get overboard before it perishes. Um, and you can see lots of bycatch and a few shrimp. So in the tropics, that's where the discard, or bycatch and discard issue still is. And there's a lot of work going on there, um, which I'm happy to answer questions about as well, because I still maintain a role in some fisheries doing this work. But we still have a long way to go. But this is what we can also get in the tropics. And that's about 8,000 pound of almost pure shrimp caught in one net. You might be able to see something over here. This is catch from the other net over this side. So this shrimp trawler in northern Australia has just caught about 16,000 pound of almost pure shrimp. A uh, matter of minutes on the bottom. And this is what it looks like when you empty the cot end and it's sitting on, the, um, sitting on the tray. And you can see a couple of people here just to give you an idea of the size. So there are even tropical shrimp fisheries around the world where the bycatch issue is relatively modest and at certain times of the year, really clean, wonderful fishing. Bottom trawling, there are areas where you still have significant problems. The orange roughy fishery off east coast Australia and in, and in New Zealand, they still do, sorry, they still do have problems with this sort of um, uh, capturing these, these um, corals and sponges and what have you and tearing them out of the seabed. Um, what they've done in a lot of those places is they've closed a lot of these areas off, so, so there's permanent bans on trawling, and some areas they do allow some fishing activity to occur. So not all areas where you catch orange ruffy, um, uh, not all areas where orange ruffy are found are fishable these days. Most trawling, as I pointed out, occurs on bottoms like this, and you can see these two images here and it has been going on for years, decades. Trawling was first introduced into the Gulf of Maine around the late 1800s, early 1900s. It's got a history of a bit over 100 years. And some trawl grounds are still fished to this day. And sometimes you get catches like this. Nice catch of cod, this is a big catch of haddock, and this is redfish. And you can see there's not many other things there other than red fish. So, trawling is far from perfect, as 
a lot, a lot of room to go, a lot of improvement. But in my mind, at least, the doom and gloom is often overstated and, and really misses the point that there has been a lot of good work, a lot of good work going on, scientists and fishermen trying to reduce the impacts. The problem is, good news doesn't necessarily sell. It's easy to sell bad news, of course. And as scientists and fishermen, we're not real good at, at shouting our success from the rooftops. And even then, not everyone wants to listen anyway. You can play a role. What role can you play? Well, if you're interested in the true impacts of fishing, you really need to be careful where you get your information from. And beware of sources of information. Many of these sources of information are biased. And ask yourself, why are they presenting information in that way? Just like you should be asking that about me. <laughs> so beware of bias and limited sources. Buy local. US fisheries are some of the best managed fisheries in the world. Most of the fisheries they manage using quota now. So while there has been a history of overfishing, that arguably should be stopped once you introduce a quota, because that's the cap on how much can be taken out of the ocean. And they're really well managed. And if you buy local, you support your local industry, of course. And also buy certified seafood. You've probably seen the seafood watch logos at some of the supermarkets. Maybe, hopefully, you know a little bit about the Responsibly Harvested brand, which we have here at GMRI, and if you don't, there's a brochure outside, which basically verifies where the seafood comes from, and it's from a, from a well-managed fishery. So there's some great things going on in the US, and you shouldn't feel, feel reluctant to buy US seafood. Remember that fishing is a food production system. Final two slides. Discarding on a global sense is, at the moment, it's been suggested at around 10 million tonnes per year. Okay, so one tonne is about 2,200 pound. So multiply that up, that's a lot of pound of fish. In the 1990s, it was around 18 million tonnes per year. So in 20 years, we've reduced the discarding by about 8 million tonnes. A lot of that is due to improved fisheries management and improved efforts by fishermen to use selective fishing gear and avoid catching stuff that they don't want, which really is a pain in the backside for them. They don't want to catch stuff if they can help it that they're just going to throw overboard. It's just extra work for a start. So we've made significant improvements. So 10 million tonnes sounds like an awful lot of fish. So let's provide a little interesting perspective which I'll leave you with. The area of the ocean is about 139 million square miles. That's a bit hard to get your head around. It sounds like a lot, but just how do we get our head around that? All right, well, let's do something a little bit funky. Let's divide 210 discard figure, 10 million tonnes, by the area of the ocean, and we get this really horrible figure, 0 0.000056 pound per square foot per year. So that, that basically says, whatever that little figure is, per square foot of ocean per year is the discards from fishing activity. Well, that figure still doesn't mean a lot. Let's do this. Now, you all know how big an American football field is. I know you do. I had to look it up, but that's understandable. <laughs> but you should all know how big it is. And it works out to about 0.3 pounds of discards over the area of a football field per year by all fishing, not just trawling, by all fishing. And if you're still struggling with that, <laughs> it's a little bit more than that per year in the size of a football field. All right, so the 10 million tonnes sounds like a lot, but it, you get a really different perspective when you come down here. I said most fishing occurred on the continental shelf, so let's sort of hone this in a little bit. The continental shelf is about 8% <coughs> of the total ocean area, and when we do the same bit of math, we get about four pounds per football field. Okay, how do we get, get a mind around that? That's about 15 quarter pounders spread out amongst that football field per year. This is the discards in the continental shelf area. And if you want to think of it a little bit differently, that's the global discards, that's the global catch, that's what's retained. So it's a relatively small proportion of the total catch. It's gone down, it's been, we've reduced this by 8 million tonnes in 20 years, and another 20 years, hopefully we've halved that or got that even less. So very different when you, you, you sort of play with the figures a little bit. So I'll leave you with that. I thank you for your time, and I'm happy to answer any questions.
talk and um, tell you what she said. Question. Please. So uh, on that picture you had of the world and places to go to all the time, are there places that have better regulations than we do? Or like are there better practices, say, around Iceland? Or, like if you could manage the fishery here in the Gulf of Maine, ideally, are there other practices you would adopt? Um, that's a great question. So if you didn't hear the question, the question basically was, are there other practices that can be can be adopted which might be being used in other countries around the world that we could bring to the US, if, if I paraphrase correctly? Um, arguably not a lot, although, I mean, the number of overfished stocks in the United States has reduced dramatically over the past handful of years. It's getting smaller all the time. In New England, we, we seem to be an area where we have most most challenges. I mean, the New England ground fish, that's a really challenging fishery. You've got 16 stocks and trying to re return their biomass to historic levels or to where you want them to be at sustainable levels is a real challenge, partly because you've got environmental influences, you know, um, warming ocean temperatures really beginning to have an impact. Um, places like Iceland, Iceland gets held up as an exemplar of, of great management, as does New Zealand, as does Australia, um, and a few other places. And now, now that the US in more recent years has moved to the quota-based system, basically joins the ranks. I think it's fair to say that there's, there's, there's always some tinkering you can do, but by and large, the management here is as good as anywhere else. Some of the issues are that, that, that the science is, 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 is challenged. You know, it's relatively easy if you're in forestry and you want to know what the biomass of trees is, just go out and count them. How do you do that in the ocean? You can't count the fish. And what they tend to do, the most common method, is to do relative abundance surveys. So fishermen go out, uh, sorry, the scientists go out, they deploy a trawl net, and then they might go back the next year to the same spot. And then they go back the next year to the same spot. And over a period of time, you look at how the relative abundance has changed. And that's an indicator of whether things are getting better or worse. The problem is it takes a long time to do those surveys. It takes a long time to analyse the results, get it through the management system and for it to be a reality. Also, with climate change, well, fish don't stay still, of course. So just because you're going to the same spot every year, maybe the time you went there, the fish weren't there for one reason or another. So it's a really challenging exercise counting the stocks, determining what their abundance is and whether they're getting better or, or, or worse. And that's a global problem. But I think, so the short answer is, you should be happy with the state of US stocks, by and large, and with the management that supports them. Yeah. Anybody else? Please. A uh, little bit of both. Uh, probably these days, most of it is is uh, is farmed. Uh, places like Thailand, um, that part of the world, there is a you know they are big in, in shrimp farming. And uh, so yeah, I mean you should. Well, this is what I do. If I want to go buy shrimp, I generally ask where it comes from. I want to know where it comes from. Uh, I would much prefer if I want to if I want to buy shrimp or I can't buy Gulf of Maine shrimp anymore, I'd much prefer Gulf of Mexico shrimp. So ideally I'd try to get it from there. And you know, there are reports of issues with, with shrimp from Southeast Asia, and some of you may not have been following it, but there have been reports of human rights abuses in, in fishing activities in Southeast Asia, and a lot of those activities are catching shrimp, or they're catching small fish which are fed to the shrimp in the farms. And that's an issue that, that's, that's only just really come to light and is really being dealt with. So you really need to be careful where you get your seafood from and when it comes to shrimp, find out where it comes from. Yeah. Please. Uh, a couple of years ago, well, several years ago, there was quite the Donnybrook between lobstermen in Maine and fishermen in Maine about whether lobster bycatch should be allowed to be landed. Because right? you can land it in Massachusetts, you can't land it in Maine. Any thoughts on the, on the science behind that? Is there Scientist, what would be your advice? Well, <laughs> that's a really loaded question. So if <laughs> yeah, you, if you did hear the question, it was, it was, um, it was basically um, fishermen in, in New Hampshire and in Massachusetts, for example, they can retain lobsters that are caught from trawling, whereas in Maine you're not allowed to do it, and that was stopped, you know, I think it was about five years ago or thereabouts. And so is that a good thing or is it a bad thing? 
And certainly, from the perspective of the lobster industry, it was a, it was a, a good decision. Um, you know, they've put a lot of time and effort in protecting their stocks. And you've probably been reading in the Press Herald, in particular, that the, the lobster landings are at record highs. Things are going really good for lobster. Um, there is one of their concerns with the fishermen going out, trawl fishermen going out and targeting lobster because of their value. And I don't have a real good sense for how prevalent that activity was, and maybe if they were, I just don't have a real good sense for it. Um, in Massachusetts, they still do it, and uh, and you know they do make some good money out of it. But you know, you saw my lobster landings in that in that there. It was about fifth or sixth by volume. So there's a fair amount of money that's derived from, from trawling lobsters. But I don't know a fisherman that say, I'm going to go out today and catch lobster. They go out to catch ground fish. They might know they're going to catch lobster. They might know that that's, that's a, a, a species they're going to retain. But that's not what they're going out to target principally. Yeah. Please. I think just, just to piggyback on that for a moment, I think one of the big issues was that it, it was a reduction in the fish fry in the The Which, sorry? It, it might have. Yeah, in some instances. Yeah. Um, but going back a bit to your discard, as I said, I had heard that one of the problems is, okay, I, re I have met or exceeded or I met my quota for cod, but I have that as a buyback. So I damn sure can't bring it in, so I'm going to discard. It's, how prevalent do you think that is? And, uh, and is the new law trying to deal with that issue to some extent? Um, well, two things, just to add to your, your lobster comment, which, which was um, uh, fuel is also, was also cheaper. Right. So a lot of, lot of, lot of main-based fishermen, uh, trawl fishermen, were catching lobster and going and unloading in Massachusetts because not only could they keep the lobsters, but they also fuel was cheaper. Um, so, sorry, what was your question again? Just <laughs> now that I answered that one is... <laughs> Uh, no, I was saying that I, that I had heard that one of the problems with discard uh, was that I have oh. met my quota for cod, yep. but I'm catching them, but they're coming in the trawl, so I'm going to discard them because I can't yeah. bring them ashore. I think what you're probably probably referring to is is in previous previous to the quota system being introduced, fishermen were managed by a day at sea, and there were often trip limits associated with that, and so when you exceeded the trip limit, then if you if you if you uh, want to land your product, you've got to discard anything ex excess to that trip limit. Um, in many instances, those limits have now gone. What happens now is that you know, fishermen ha generally have sufficient quota that when they go out, they know whether, whether they're, they're going to get, generally they know if they're going to get close to their quota or not. Although in some instances, one day might be enough for a fisherman to actually reach his quota, perhaps even exceed it. Um, it is possible to lease quota from, from other fishermen and, and there's, there's an active market in leasing, leasing quota. The problem is when you do that, the quota price for cod now is probably close to about $3 a pound and fishermen aren't getting much more than that for that, for that fish. So you're actually spending money um, on quota. You're catching a fish that you're not actually getting any profit out of but it's allowing you to catch other species and, and profit that way. So there's, there's a little bit of an issue there. Um, but by and large, you know, fishermen try to manage their operation as best they can and ensure that they don't exceed that quota. And that's one of the good things about quota is that you can now plan your fishing activity much better than you could in the old days, particularly when I was fishing and there was no quota and you just went out and you just <coughs> hit the stock as hard as you can and that's how you made money. But it wasn't, but it's a bite chart, but it's a bite chart. Yeah, indeed, and, and the ULOC... I can be more species specific when I draw. Yeah, I mean, it's... Because it, you, you, you're fishing a, a, a multi-species complex, if you like, and it's very hard to tease one species out from that complex. And so here we are. We know that cod generally swim... Well, if you want to catch flounders, we all know that flounders generally sitting on the bottom, for the most part. Cod are going to be swimming reasonably clear of the bottom. So it makes sense. Try to build a net that goes under them 
and those in the path, we know from video observation that cod will rise when they encounter fishing gear. And so we're exploiting that behaviour as well. And we've got some other net designs where we've done that as well and had similar success in avoiding cod. And just by understanding behaviour, uh, we, can, we can try to design nets that pull the species out or let the species go that you don't want to catch and retain all the others. The problem is it's not a perfect science. And, of course, there are some cod that just... They don't want to rise up. They just want to stay close to the bottom when they get caught. Um, but if we can do things like this, reduce catch by 45%, then that's a great result in moving in the right direction. Ma'am. Yeah. <coughs> oh, so, go on. I'll just you. Well, I don't mind if you want to We can have both questions. So the question is about, if you didn't hear it, it was about using lead in the, the ground gear. And yeah, increasingly lead's not used. And you know, they'll use chain, um, um, steel, pieces of steel. Um, it, the, they use steel wire rope that passes through, through the cable. So increasingly lead's not used, it's just steel wire rope and, and, um, um, and the rubber. But um, yeah, so great question on the lead. We have one more? Given we, given we had a bit of confusion. No, I, I, I read a while back, and it's a little fuzzy in my mind, but can they target uh, fish? Like, I, I thought I read some places that they, if they go for haddock, they come up, up a little bit higher to look at, avoid the cod. How do they do that? Yeah. Um, we can do it with, with, with other species as well. But um, So it's, it's possible if you know, all fishermen have an echo sounder on the boat, um, which basically is, is transmitting sound in the water, you're getting an echo, it comes back to the boat and it's displayed on a screen, for those who don't know. And fish schools generally have, often are quite distinguishable. <coughs> so you could distinguish between um, a haddock school and a herring school, for example. Um, they're two species that, that aggregate here in the Gulf of Maine. And so with experience, fishermen know that, oh yeah, that's, that's herring, so I won't go fish for that. I want haddock and I'll go fish for that. And, and that generally just comes through trial and error and years of experience. And you sort of know after a while where the haddock should be at certain times of the year. And then you put the gear through and yes, they are haddock. That confirms your suspicion. And then if you go back next year, well, I was successful. It looks again like haddock. That school over there is, is herring, so I won't touch that one. I'll go over here. So you can, but, but species that are close down on the bottom don't give good echoes. And so flounder, for example, you can't see them on the bottom. Um, individual cod, you'd have trouble. You might be able to under cer cer certain circumstances. Um, so it's not always possible to see fish using an echo sounder uh, or to be able to distingu distinguish what they are. But with experience, you can get pretty close. Yeah. Well, thank you um, once again, both Steve for the presentation and you for coming here tonight. Indeed. And all the great questions, uh, you may be able to corner them on your way out if you still have a yeah. question that hasn't been answered. Um, and we really appreciate you coming tonight. This is the Joanne Morton Kelly Sea State Lecture, the first in our series of debunking ocean myths. And if there's materials out on the table as you leave on GMRI on our seafood program, and if you are interested and willing to support us, there's also donation cards because we obviously um, live and breathe on a lot of the charitable contributions that are given to us by people like you. But even if just literature, we're happy to have you come. Thank you.